those of you joining from home, glad you're with us too. If you haven't grabbed an outline yet, they are in the back, and you can uh, certainly grab and take a, advantage of that. Today we're going to be looking at, we're going to start a series on the book of Romans, uh, but to begin with, uh, last, last week we talked a little bit about social media and social platforms. Jonah was a great help in doing that. We want to share another forum that we haven't shared, uh, I think, very often here in, in church. But this is from Chad Bird. And it's a TikTok. He posts a lot to TikTok. Uh, so, uh, and he he's kind of focuses a lot on the Old Testament, which is kind of something that just kind of, uh, I love the way he connects Old Testament stuff with New Testament truth. So we're just going to share that really quick with you. Let me encourage you to think of biblical study as a form of worship. It's not just an intellectual enterprise where you use your mind to discern what the teaching and will of the Lord might be based upon the Bible. It certainly is that, but it's much more than that. Biblical study is a form of worship. A great text for understanding it this way is found in the book of Ezra, certainly not the most popular book in the Old Testament, but an instructive book. So when Ezra himself is described in chapter 7, we read that Ezra had set his heart to study the Torah of Yahweh. Now, in Hebrew, the verb for study is darash. It also means to, to search out, to, to seek after, to inquire into. In fact, if you look at the very end of Ezra chapter 6, where the Passover is being described, we read that it was celebrated by all those who sought to darash the Lord, which is sometimes translated as seek and sometimes translated as worship. So when they celebrated the Passover, they were darash. They were looking for, inquiring after, seeking after, worshiping the Lord. And that Ezra himself is described as one who darash, who seeks out, looks into the Torah of Yahweh. So when we're looking into the Torah or any part of the scriptures, when we're seeking it, when we're inquiring, when we're searching, when we're studying, we're not looking just for answers. We're looking for God. We're worshiping him. We're worshiping the very God who gave us the scriptures. So as we talk about studying, especially this book of Romans, the idea is that it's worship. It's not just Bible study, it's worship. You know, when you seek after God and you want the best from, from God, we, we want to get into God's word. Now, whether you're using today, and as we go through this, it, whether you're using the outline or whether you're using your Bible, I want to encourage you to do a couple different things. Things that I always do in any Bible that I'm, I'm looking at or reading is that I want to encourage you to circle things that jump out at you, to underline things, to highlight, to underscore, to draw arrows, uh, to point out things, uh, exclamation marks, uh, question marks, if you come across something that doesn't make sense to you or you don't understand what's going on, uh, to make comments in the margins of your Bible or of your paper to uh, ask right questions in the margins. The idea there is to work the book and don't be afraid uh, to write in your Bible. It should be the ultimate workbook. It shouldn't be so sacred that we don't touch it. <laughs> so sacred that we never open it, you know, that kind of thing. And we can't find it. Uh, it should not be like the Ark of the Covenant where you can't find it anywhere in your house. So, so you want to work the book. You want, you want to check it out. Uh, one of the scholars that I follow that I think the world of, he, he, he wrote, writes this. He says, if, if you read something in the Bible or if you hear something, if it sounds or if it seems weird, it's probably important. So... If, if it's probably important, then, then highlight it somehow. Draw your attention back to it. And then don't be satisfied till you get an answer for what it is that you're looking at. Don't, don't walk away going, well, I guess, I guess we'll never know. Or, uh, you know, we'll, we'll never get a good answer for that. Search it out. I mean, one of the things I'm fi I find all the time is that it just takes some digging to find out, you know, a good answer for why did they do this and what's going on. So... Today I'm going to give kind of a little bit of a background and kind of set up the context a little bit for the book of Romans, and we'll get into the first few verses of it, and then we're just going to start chipping away and chewing at this. So if you've got some favorite uh, questions about Romans, let me know in advance. Don't do it the same day of, because I may not have a good answer, but if you've got some questions about things that you've read about, that you've been intrigued about, or that you're curious, or that maybe has been a challenge for you, please let us know, and we'll try to address that if we possibly can. 
So the book of Romans is uh, probably one of the most important books of the Bible that we're going to read. The first 12 chapters, basically Paul writes to this church and gives them kind of what we would call systematic theology. He kind of lays out what we believe. And the last half of the, of the book of Romans is putting it into practice. So I think that's a great way to do it. You know, we should know what we believe and then we should know how to put it into practice. So that's some, one of the things that happens. And the book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul from the city of Corinth where 1st and 2nd Corinthians is addressed to. And he wrote this about A.D. 57, while he was on his third missionary journey. And so in Paul's day, Rome was the largest city in the world. It had a population of about a million people at the time. So a, a large metropolitan. A lot of those people in, the, in Rome at that time were slaves. You know, not slaves like in Antebellum South, but slaves in terms of being household slaves, people that worked and had a relatively um, uh, amount of freedom that was available to them. Paul had been preaching for about 25 years at the time that he wrote this letter. And his hope was to move his uh, place of enterprise from Antioch to Rome because he was getting ready to head to the last known part of the known world, which was Spain. And so he was hoping to have this church set up as a place for him to change his, his base of operations to, to Rome. And so in AD 49, so about eight years before this letter was written, the Caesar Claudius expelled all the Jews who were living in Rome, uh, including Aquila and Priscilla. And that's why Aquila and Priscilla were out doing their thing. And if you look in Acts, you'll see where they meet up with the Apostle Paul in Corinth and they they do ministry there. The, the reason they're there is because they got kicked out of Rome. How many of you have ever been kicked out of someplace? Thank you. Kind, kindred spirit. Yeah, you don't admit it. That's right. Never say die. We appreciate that. Uh, and so as a result, the church in Rome, which had been formed by, after the, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, all these people from all the different parts of the world, they experience the Holy Spirit. They, they listen to what's going on. They go back home. Some people went back to Rome, established the church. The church is flourishing, doing well, almost to the point to where they're doing too well because they're causing trouble uh, because of this guy named Christus or Christus, Jesus Christ. And so be, because they were seen as being a part of the Jewish tribe, Claudius kicks them all out of Rome. Well, who's left behind are Gentile Christians. And when Paul writes to the church in Rome, he's basically writing to Gentiles who had stayed around. Jews were starting to come back, but the, the tenor of the church had changed from being very Jewish to now being very Gentile. Uh, it was very much of a, a different flavor than what it had originally. And so the dynamics had changed. And if you look at the book of, of Romans, especially as we get into the last part of the first chapter, you might be tempted because Paul talks about you know, sex and gender issues and homosexuality. It's tempting for people to think that Romans may be a hit piece to hit certain types of people or certain people groups, and that's not what he's doing. He's just talking about, you know, serving God and being aware of, of sin that's going on and that people need to turn to Christ and find him and experience him. So it's not a hit piece, and that needs to be something that we understand because in this day and age, uh, Romans chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6 are the two main passages of Scripture that are trotted out when you're dealing with LGBTQ people and people are beating each other up with those passages of Scripture. Scripture is not meant to beat anybody up with. It's meant to reveal truth and to point people to Jesus. Okay? So it's not about beating people up. It's not meant to be a hit piece by any means. And so Paul's writing to this church and he's never been there. Other churches, whether he's writing to Ephesus or to Galatia or to Colossae or Thessalonica um, or, or Corinth, he's been there. He's, he's either set the churches up, he pastored the churches, he has a team that's working there. He's been personally involved. Rome is the one church where he has not been the main influence. He has not been the main guy. And so he's writing to them, and aside from the people that you read about in chapter 16, uh, where Paul mentions a few specific people that he's met on his travels and that he has association with, he, um, he doesn't know anybody there. So he's kind of writing a, a letter that, 
uh, you know, has no necessarily real introduction aside from the per person who takes it and presents it to them. And so Romans is highly esteemed because it presents the sinfulness of mankind and yet presents also the power of God to save people from their sin. And so it's one thing to say, hey, you're going to hell or you're, you're in sin or you're in darkness or you're going in the wrong direction and to just leave it there. That what Romans does and what Paul does and what we should do as Christians is that we present what's going on but then say, but there's a solution. And God has a path and God has a way for you to know who, who Jesus is. And so he lays out how we should believe and how we should live. And one of the things that he talks about especially is he talks about the good news. He talks about how that the good news is that Christ died for us on the cross, that we are saved by faith and not by works, and that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, anybody and everybody can have salvation through Christ alone. And so that's the good news. And that's what he preaches and that's what he shares with those around us. And so one of the questions that, some, among the questions that we can ask ourselves during this time is that Romans presents this idea, do we believe in God enough to live out our faith? You know, it's one thing to say, well, I believe in God, but I'm not going to change my life to, to make that happen, you know. Do we believe in God enough to live out our faith. One, one author talks about it as be, believing loyalty. That I believe in God so much. I, I cannot help but live my faith out. Amen. I have to do this. I have to live this way. I have to speak to people. I can't shut myself up. I have to tell people about Jesus. Because of what he has done for me. And what he's doing in my life. To live, do we live out the things that we say that we believe. I really believe this stuff. And so do we really know what Christians believe and why we believe it? So one of the things that we want to do in Romans is that we want to look at, examine, and maybe challenge some of the things that you believe, that we believe, and answer the question, why do we believe this? Because when we understand why we believe these things, it's not hard to share with others. It's not hard to share truth. And so we want you to become confident about what's going on and what's taking place. And the way that we know is by going through God's word, taking, getting into it and letting God's words soak into our soul and into our spirit. One of the things that Paul does, and all the New Testament authors do this, is that they build their letters, these letters called the, uh, the epistles is another word for letters, uh, that these letters are built upon the foundation of the Old Testament. And so the better you know the Old Testament, the more sense the New Testament makes, and you begin to see the connecting points between the old and the new. Sorry, old's on this side, new's on this side. The old and the new. And that you see that they connect and go, oh, that's why they said that. Oh, that's why that connects. And so um, do not feel like the Old Testament doesn't apply. The New Testament authors are alluding to and pointing back to the Old Testament all the time. And so the more you understand it, the better it is. Got it? There? Taking a breath? All right, Will. Okay, there we go. Now, I'm also using the, the New Living Translation uh, to go through this. And the reason I'm using New Living Translation, normally I look at the New International Version, the NIV, but the NLT is just a little bit more easier to read, a little bit easier to understand some of the concepts and things. So if you have the NIV and you feel like you're being left behind, you are not. If you feel like you have the New Living Translation and you're beginning to feel superior, do not. You, you are, we're just working our way through this. That's all that it is. And so here's what Paul writes to the, uh, to the Christians living in Rome, beginning with verse 1. He identifies himself this way. He says, this letter is from Paul. A and he uses the analogy of that I'm a slave of, of Christ Jesus, uh, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. Well, what's the good news? The good news is that Jesus has come to save people. God loves people. And he wants everyone to be saved, no one to be lost. And th those who put believing faith in Christ will be saved. And that's, in essence, that's the good news. That's what we preach. That's what we tell people. That's what we talk about. Is that no one has gone so far that God cannot save them. That God reaches out to everyone, no matter how uh, despicable or how big of a jerk or how many mistakes that they've made. God reaches out to each and every one of us. 
and everyone that we know that God reaches to people. And so that's what Paul says, that God has appointed me, has anointed me to be a preacher of his good news. Verse 2, God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So again, he's alluding back to Old Testament. And he says, the good news is about his son. I would underline that and highlight that. Matter of fact, I have in my notes. Uh, highlight that. that it, that's what the good news is about. It's about Jesus. Taking the mystery out of the good news. What's the gospel? It's about the gospel is the story of Jesus. It's the good news. And so uh, in, the, in his earthly life, Paul picks up in his earthly life, Jesus was born into the King David's family line. Again, another allusion back to the Old Testament. And he was shown, Jesus was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, that is a key concept. Because as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, without the resurrection, Christianity is worthless. Yeah. It's, it's meaningless. But the resurrection is the key because it shows that God has the power over death, hell, and the grave because of what Jesus has done. Because Jesus is risen, we have hope that we too will be risen and abide with him throughout all eternity with God. That's the key concept. And so one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that the resurrection is always key. It's always the main thing. And anyone who tries to say otherwise is, is missing. As a matter of fact, all other world, some of the other world views is that Jesus really wasn't crucified, that Jesus really wasn't raised from the dead, that Jesus really wasn't a man, that Jesus really wasn't God. There's all kinds of variations on those themes to get away from the fact that there's power in the resurrection. Because if Jesus is raised from the dead, then he is God incarnate and able to do that which he has promised to us to do. And so the resurrection is so important for us and we believe in the resurrection. Matter of fact, Paul goes on to say that Jesus is Christ our Lord and through Christ God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him bringing glory to to his name. So the idea here is that by knowing the gospel and sharing the gospel, people's lives are changed and are transformed through the power of God. And then he says in verse 6 to the Romans, but it also applies to us, he says, and you are included. You are included. Think about that. Christianity is an inclusive religion. Yeah. You're included. Yeah. You're not so far gone. This message is for all to believe. You are included. And again, I like to bring up, think about all the people that you don't want to include in your circle. All the people you don't like. All the people that you don't want to invite to the barbecue. All the people at the family reunion that you avoid. The people that you see in the supermarket that you go down the other, hall, the other aisle so that you don't have to talk with them. They're included. They're included. And God includes all these people. He says, you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to what? To belong to Jesus Christ. God wants everyone to belong to Jesus Christ. Everyone won't because people will reject him and don't want to go his direction. But God wants everyone to believe and belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God. So he's reinforcing that idea. Loved by God and you are called to be his own holy people. What a wonderful message that is. Paul tells them that they're loved and that they're set apart. They're made holy. They're, uh, holy is that word for sanctification. When you're sanctified, it's not like you're set apart and you can't do anything. No, you're set apart to belong to God, to be his. And both, someone has said that before believers are called, they are loved. Listen, there are people, we would love to fill this place uh, with, with people who maybe don't know God because even before they know God, before they receive Christ, they are loved by God. Yes. Okay. And then that means that we got to love them too. Yes. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to see their credentials first. I want to make sure that they're card carrying members of. No, the idea is that people are loved by God before they ever receive him. Yes. And therefore God calls us to love them too yes. and to care about them as well. Now, again, Rome was a very sinful and morally decadent city and system, which is good news for us because it prepares us for the world we live in, which is very worldly and decadent. Uh, and we have that going on as well. Sometimes we think that in America we're not as bad as, as we think we are, but we are. 
We're probably worse than what we think we are. And as holy people, Christians are meant to live by high moral standards, not like those that were popular in Rome at the time. God calls us as, as followers of Jesus to live better than others. We're not better than others, but we're called to live a better lifestyle and to live uh, ethically, morally, with better character than those around us. Woohoo! Aren't you excited? Well, how come it's go, go back to go back to when you're a kid? Well, mom, how come I have to if they're not going to make them do it? Yeah. Right? Because God has called us yeah. to be light in darkness. God has called us to live better and differently, to, yeah. to, to raise the standard of behavior and living and civility and morality, yeah. to show people what it's like to love God. Don't you love Romans? It gets better. All right. Yeah, it gets into more stuff. Someone has said this, that obedience to God will always challenge. Obedience to God will always challenge the prevailing attitudes and values of society. Christians are the ones who make difference in the world because we have a different standard. We live according to what God wants us to live. And that's what we do. And then Paul says, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So that was his preamble. That was the, the beginning. That's how it goes. Verse 8, let me say first that I thank my God through Christ Jesus for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. The church and the people of Rome, their faith was, was going out there. People were going, hey, have you heard about the church in Rome? Have you heard about these people? Have you experienced what, what they've experienced? They had a great reputation, a good positive reputation. It made me think and ask the question, what's your reputation like? What's our reputation like as a church community? That's something I'm always trying to, to understand. Do people even know that we exist? Do people even know that we're here? And then what do they say about those people who go to our church and are part of our church community? What's our reputation like? What are we evidencing? What are we living out? And that was one of the things that the apostle says to the people in Rome is that I've heard good things about you. You guys have a good reputation. And in verse 9, he says, God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all of my heart by spreading the good news about his son. So Paul says that there's value in praying for others and that uh, one of the reasons why we pray for our missionaries and we have a prayer chain and we pray uh, for those who are in need, is that we believe that in praying that God does something that helps and makes a difference and an impact. And Paul says, I've been praying for you guys. I, and here's the thing, he's never even met them. He's never even been there yet. But he says, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for the things that, that are important f for the kingdom of God to take place for them. And, he's, and he reminds us first that we should be people who pray and then that we should all, and not only pray for ourselves, but pray for others too. Yeah. And that God calls all of us to a life of prayer. He had a consistent habit of prayer. Do you have a consistent habit of praying? Because prayer is a habit that is learned. It's not a spiritual gift. It's a, it's a habit that we train ourselves into praying. Yeah. And so what does your, you don't have to say anything out loud, but maybe in the corner of your Bible or your notes, you might make a note. What's your habit of prayer? Do you pray on a regular basis? Are you connecting with God? And then are you praying for others? Because those are beneficial things that, that build you as well as build others. And Paul also says that he serves God by telling people about Jesus. His occupation was a tent maker. That's how he would make a living if he, if he didn't have support. But he, so he was basically bivocational. He would use his occupation as a, mo as a means to tell people about Jesus. He'd be in the marketplace. He'd be putting the, the tents together. People would come by the shop, the stall, wherever he was working, and they would, you know, talk about commerce and whatever was going on and what do you, what's the order that you need. And in the process of that, he would work in to talking to them about Jesus. Isn't it interesting that how easy that can be that, that we can bring Jesus into the marketplace. I know that in our day and age, we have to be careful that you, of what you say and how you say things at work so you don't get fired for, you know, putting 
all the bad stuff on people. But the idea there is that, is that it's okay to talk to people about Jesus and that he worshiped God and he served God by talking to people simply about Jesus. And that's one of the things that we can do effectively is talk to people about Christ. So think about that. We serve God by talking to people about Jesus. And if you wonder what you can do for God, this is one area that you can be confident in. Tell people about Jesus. You don't have to beat them up with a scripture in a Bible. And I don't know, we probably all have examples and in, in stories of where we've seen street pe preachers who are out there just making a pain of themselves to people and, and just being obnoxious and all those things. But I'll tell you, some of those street preachers, they get people's attention and they make them think about something. I don't like it. It's not my style. I don't want to go hang around with them. But God uses crazy people too. So why not you and me? Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. And so it's your actions and your behavior at work that's going to draw people because one of the things that people will see is that, where are you going, to, where are you going this weekend? I'm going to church. Huh. Well, that's interesting. But you know what? Come down the road, something goes on. They'll say, hey, um, hey would you mind praying for me and my family because we're walking through something right now. You preach the gospel by how you live yeah. and who you are. In verse 10, Paul says, one of the things that, by the way, I'm only going to verse 17. I just want to give you some hope, all right? I'm not going to do the whole first chapter. Just, you guys are so nice, you'd probably sit here and do that, but I'm not going to do that to you. Verse 10, one of the things I always pre pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. And so he had this personal desire to visit them, and he prays for that moment. And one of the great things from this is that personal prayers are okay. I've heard some people say that they just don't feel like they're supposed to have any personal agenda in their prayers. Sure, go for it. Paul wanted, to, Paul wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to hang out. He was hoping that he'd be able to go to Spain and see other people and, and plant other churches. He says, verse 11, For I long to visit you so I can bring something, some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. And when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith. But I also want to be encouraged by your faith. And so the purpose of fellowship and community is that we encourage each other. He wanted to give them something, but he also had an expectation that what they had in their community would be really good for him as well. So that there's this mutual sharing and giving to one another. And so this was a church that had encountered persecution. They had encountered negative attention by the Roman authorities, and they were also uh, not looked upon in a positive manner by the others in Rome as well. And so he sees the opportunity to encourage them, but also to be encouraged by them as well. The NIV says it this way, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, that what you have to offer is precious, and I want, I want to be around that. I want to experience that. So we are to do both. We're to encourage and to be encouraged. And so a question this morning is, who are you encouraging? Who are you purposely encouraging? And then there are many times that you are encouraging others just by being who you are. Many times you're encouraging just by holding steady in the midst of a season of difficult issues, of difficult times. And so hang in there. Don't be, don't be discouraged as you're walking through tough times because we're watching and we are being encouraged as you hold steady to Jesus as you're walking through these difficult times of life. Verse 13, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, I plan many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. Have you ever made plans and they just fall apart? Yep, that's what was going on there. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit just as I've seen among other Gentiles. And so he's talking or using the language of Rome that's, that's going on here. They were mostly Gentiles or Greeks. They were not as Jewish as the church had once been. So he used concepts and word pictures that made sense to them. But Paul's desire was to see spiritual fruit grow in their lives because the evidence of God the evidence of God living and growing is inside of us. And so when God's at work inside of us, we begin to share God. God begins to, to pop out. If God's alive inside of you, you cannot hold him down. God just pops out. I can't help myself. I had to be nice. I couldn't help myself. You know, that, that, and that's the neat thing. 
And so the idea is that God living and working in us is meant to be visible. Verse 14, for I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated. So I am eager to come to you in Rome too, to preach the good news, to tell people about Jesus. To tell people about Jesus. That's what I want to do. I want to tell people about Jesus. So think about your circumstances and your situation where um, a lot of times in America, what we, what we tend to think is that what I will do, I will bring someone, I'll, I'll invite someone to a church service or to a church event and pastor, you tell them about Jesus. I'll set them up, you knock them down. <laughs> that kind of thing. But the reality is that, is that we tell people about Jesus before they even get here. We tell people about Jesus by the way that we live and the way that we talk and the way that we conduct ourselves. And so he says he was eager to engage with people so that he could share the message of Jesus. Do we have something? Do we give people something of value when we encounter them? And so I want to encourage you to do that. And then verse 16 and 17 are the, are the verses I want to, to finish with today, which I think is, are, is one of the most important verses or set of verses that are in the Bible, or at least clarifying, because Paul says this, for I am not ashamed of the, of the gospel or of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentiles. And he says, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. And so that we come to faith, uh, come to Christ through faith. And that God has this ability, has this, this, it works. That when people hear about Jesus, God is able to set them free. God is able to save their soul. God is able to bring to them to a saving knowledge of him. That is the power of God. So in talking to people about God, sharing the gospel is what transforms people's lives. Do not hesitate to tell people about Jesus. Do not hesitate to share difficult passages of Scripture, to talk to people about sin, to talk to people about righteousness, to talk about failures, to talk about the hopes and dreams that we have. Don't be afraid because it's the power of God to salvation. It's what changes people. It's the message of Jesus. In all the other world religions that are out there, Jesus is the only... Christianity is the only one where God comes down and makes, makes it so that God solves the problem of sin. Yeah. All other religions, you have to try to do something to get the approval of God to maybe, just maybe make it into heaven or whatever paradise or version of that that might be. Christianity is the only one where God says, I have paid the price so that you might know me. Yeah. And that it's not by works, it's by faith. Believe in your heart that Christ is the Lord and you will be saved. What a tremendous message. And what that faith does is it transforms us to where I so believe this that I'm going to live my life in such a way as to e exemplify that. And so it's at that, it's at that pinnacle pivot point of, of verses 16 and 17 that Paul then begins to go into some difficult passages of Scripture as we'll look at next week. Some challenging things because it deals with things that we wrestle with in our society and culture today regarding the LGBTQ issues that, are, are, that so overwhelm us and overwhelm people that we love dearly, yeah. that we care about so much. How do we share Jesus to people without making them feel that we hate them, we don't like them, and that we don't want them around when the opposite is totally the way it is, that God loves people. And so we never preach the gospel. We never share the gospel with this idea that God hates people. We share it with that God loves people and wants everyone to come to a saving knowledge of him. Yeah. All right. I know I did that in rapid fire, so, but I'm going to shut up because I respect our time. And plus I'm all done with that stuff. So, so here's the thing. Maybe you're here today and you, I, you don't, you're not sure about your relationship with God. God loves you. 
And God shares Jesus so that we might know him. Jesus died on the cross so that we might know him. And that we are saved through faith. Not because of my effort or my energy, but by simply saying, God, I believe you. Help me to follow you and know you better. And when we make a confession of faith of something like that, God comes into our lives, forgives us of our sins, and begins to lead us and guide us. And then he puts people on our path so that we can maybe bring them along with us on the, on the journey. That's what God wants us to do. And so my prayer this week is that we would be solid in our relationship with God, but that we begin to open our eyes to people who don't know God, that we can maybe share our hope in Christ with those who don't know him yet. And that God will give you opportunities. Whether you're camping or glamping or doing the motel thing or whatever you're doing, that wherever your location is, that God is, is giving you opportunity. So let's pray. Father, this morning as we come into your presence, Lord, you, you know what's going on in our lives. On the outside, God, everything might look nice and solid and, and fine. But God, you know what's going on inside of us. And we pray, God, that you would help us to reach out to you and say, God, help us. God, save us if we don't know you. God, refresh us. Lord, do what's needed so that we might know you beyond a shadow of a doubt. And Lord, that you would lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. And then, Lord, we pray also for those who maybe are not following you. Maybe they're doing their own thing, going their own direction. God, maybe they don't know you at all. But, God, you love them and you care about them. Give us opportunities, Lord, to say or do or be in their path somehow, some way, that they might be able to turn to you and say, God, we want you too. And so, Lord, we pray for a powerful opportunity to encounter you personally but for others to encounter you as well. And so, Lord, be at work in us and through us, Father, that we might share the good news, the gospel of Jesus with those who don't know you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.